Hello everyone and welcome to another edition of the Crichton Report Extended and this time we enter the sixth form. President's a crook. Well, I'm not a crook. I've earned everything I've got. There is discord, may we bring harmony. Where there is error, may we bring truth. Where there is doubt, may we bring faith. which I will talk about another time. But there's me, I passed two O-levels, physics and maths, and I think I'm the bee's knees. I think I'm all it, because uh, I found them quite difficult, quite a lot of work to pass them, uh, and I only wanted to do two A-levels. I only wanted to do physics and maths. So I was telling everybody, yeah, yeah, everything will be okay, I'm just gonna tell Mr. Warren, head of our sixth form, I just wanna do physics and maths, you know, there'll be no problem. Everyone tried to uh, assure me, uh, I don't think he's going to let you do that. No, 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 that's all I wanna do. Anyway, I phone up Mr. Warren and I say to him, well, I passed physics and maths, I just wanna do uh, two A-levels. And Mr. Warren says to me, it's not enough, you need four. And I said, yes, but uh, I only wanna do physics and maths. And he says to me, uh, go up to your physics and maths teacher and tell them that you've only got two O-levels and they'll tell you where to put your two O-levels. And I was in a shock. I went, oh no, I've got to waste another year. Mr. Warren was uh, being cruel to be kind. He actually said to me he was being cruel to be kind. But you know when you memorise, you memorise the phone call. I mean, I was in shock that I had to do uh, more O-levels to do uh, my A-levels. But... Uh, uh, he actually said to me uh, that uh, my uh, maths teacher and my physics teacher will actually tell me where to put my uh, two O-levels. So I want to ask Mr. Warren, where exactly will Mr. Evans and Mr. Beard tell me to put my two O-levels? No, Mr. Warren, since we're speaking succinctly, I want to know where Mr. Evans and Mr. Beard is going to tell me to put my two O-levels. Seriously, if I was back there, I would have asked and I would have pressurised Mr. Warren to tell me exactly where my physics teacher and my maths teacher were going to tell me to put my two O-levels. <laughs> but having said that, Mr. Warren, he was a great guy. Uh, he was cruel to be kind. In the end, I, 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 I did the sixth form uh, and uh, did a whole load of uh, retakes and actually got uh, a whole load of O-levels. Uh, if I hadn't have done that, uh, maybe things wouldn't have been as good. Uh, but uh, yeah, I do actually thank Mr. Warren, even though he told me where to put my two O-levels. So going back a bit to uh, establish how we got to physics, uh, it all started uh, with general science. You would have uh, general science for the first three years. 
first year, second year, third year, and then you would choose the specific science. I mean, you didn't have to choose any of the sciences at all. Uh, it was split up into biology, chemistry, and physics. Anyway, we're in the third year uh, in uh, general science with Mr. Dane, uh, really, really great teacher. I really used to like Mr. Dane uh, as our general science uh, master. I used to be his star pupil. Uh, it wasn't difficult to be his star pupil considering we had people like uh, Terence Cricket and Simon Kowalski in the class. But I was his star pupil. Anyway, one day he says to us, um, does anyone know the speed of light? And I'm putting my hand up, yeah, yeah, Mr. Dane, I, I know the speed of light. Okay, what is it, Andres? Now, <laughs> I used to have this book, a uh, really, really simple book. I mean, uh, it was really for 10 or 11 year olds. It was, uh, I think it was called, What, Why and Where? Why does thunder occur? You know, well, why does light, why is uh, lightning faster than the, the sound of thunder? Things like that in the book. And I seem to remember that in the book it said something like, the speed of light is so many zeros that no one's ever calculated it. So I put my hand up and said, yeah, I know that, uh, sir, it is so many zeros uh, and it's so far away the speed of light that uh, no one's ever calculated it. And he says, 186,000 miles per second. I went, well, uh, okay, obviously, obviously someone has calculated it. Anyway, uh, one day, one, uh, one uh, general science lesson, Mr. Uh, Mr. Dane has this uh, diagram, this circuit on the board. And uh, I, I have to admit, I'm not sure if it was exactly like this, but I seem to remember there was a few light bulbs in series and there was one light bulb on its own. Anyway, these two sixth formers walk into the class and uh, Mr. Dane, I don't know what reason they came into the class, but they walked in and Mr. Zane said to them, uh, do you know the answer to this question? What happens to this bulb when I switch the circuit on? And one of them goes, I don't know, sir. Light? Would it light up? Uh, and he says, no, it won't. Who knows the answer? Simon Kowalski puts his hand up and said, it will burst, sir. Very good, Simon. Very good. And the other two, there's two sixth formers looking at each other and said, we had no idea that it would burst. They walk out of the room. Obviously, Simon Kowalski uh, had been told the answer, you know, and he looks uh, so clever in front of the two sixth formers. And Mr. Dane says, it does them good, uh, it does them good, these sixth formers, to know that uh, there are people younger than them that uh, could be more intelligent. And I wanted to turn around to Mr. Dane and I said, what good has it done those two sixth formers to know that Simon Kowalski you know, the brains of Britain has just outfoxed them, outclassed them, outmaneuvered them, outintelligenced them. Uh, it would have done them no good whatsoever. So at the end of the third year, we do our general science exam. This time it's in the hall. Uh, and it's all uh, different. For, uh, for instance, you would have half an hour, they will give you a biology paper. Half an hour they will give you a physics paper and the other half an hour they will give you a chemistry paper. Now remember, we've only known it as general science uh, for the whole year. So uh, it's now in the hall, a proper exam, and I say to Terence Cricket, uh, are you going to study? Are you going to, I'm, I'm going home to study. And he says to me, study? What are you studying for? What we know, we know already. I couldn't believe that statement from Terence Cricket. I told my other friends, uh, they all started laughing. Uh, yeah, what we know, we know already. Uh, it's quite correct that uh, it's true. What he knew, he knew already, because he knew F all. <laughs> totally failed the exam and everything. Uh, I think I did okay. Uh, I passed that exam and got into uh, quite high levels uh, in the uh, sciences in the next year. But yes, what he knew, he knew already. Uh, Terence Cricket knew as much as Simon Kowalski. What he knew, he knew already was correct. They both knew F all. So now we're in the physics class with Mr. Beard in the fourth year. Uh, and we're doing a test with him. And I'm expecting, I think I'm all the bee's knees, you know, one of the best in the class, as I told you. Uh, I was the best in the class with uh, Mr. Dane. 
Uh, I'm with Mr. Beard now and he gives us our very first test and I'm expecting it to be really sophisticated like something like uh, describe the inner workings of a fridge. Uh, that's the kind of level I thought. I thought it would be really, really high standard. Uh, in the end, I over revised and all it was was a uh, multiple choice. Uh, what is the temperature of a nicely warm room? And I sort of thought, what the hell is that? You know, I'm sort of thinking, well, the body temperature is about 37. So I thought, yeah, I thought maybe the same temperature. Uh, no, so all silly answers uh, really did badly in that test. A friend of mine called Scott Yates was in that class and he starts acting all flash. Well, Andreas, the uh, temperature of the body is 37, so the temperature of the room is not going to be 37, is it? Uh, and all this kind of stuff, he gets a really top mark. I get a really bad mark, as I told you. I thought it was going to be uh, of an O-level standard from the very first uh, minute. It wasn't. Uh, so Mr. Beard comes over and I, and I actually apologise. I actually apologise to Mr. Beard. I'm looking at my paper. It's a low score. And I said, I'm sorry, Mr. Beard. You know, I, I, really, I really should have done better. And Mr. Beard is sort of acting indifferent, uh, as if to say, I mean, you could hear him thinking. I said, well, I expected you to do this badly. Uh, yeah, so, <laughs> you know, great teacher and everything. Instead of having confidence in his pupils, uh, he had uh, little faith uh, in, any of us, in any of us at all. Uh, on the very first day with Mr. Beard, he showed us uh, a book, An Abbot. Now, it was really good, this habit. It's about this thick, this wide and everything. Everything to do with physics O-level. Even the O-level exam is designed around the Abbott book. And I was really impressed with it. I understood it was really uh, expensive and everything. And all I said was, uh, you know, I fancy one of these. And old Roger Meggs, I don't know how I found out this, old Roger Meggs actually says to Mr. Beard, I think you better watch it because Andreas is after one of these books. And he says, yeah, I know. You know, now Roger Meggs says, so first of all, if I wanted an Abbott, which I did buy an Abbott, I could have bought a hundred Abbots. A uh, hundred books. If my mum said to me, if I said to my mum, I need this book and that book, she would give me. I always had the money to buy the book. But that was on the very first day. Roger, Mo Roger Meggs probably doesn't even remember that he said that. Okay, that is one sentence that Roger Meggs says. And that was on the very first day. I had to live with that stigma with Mr. Beard for years after that. You know, getting off on the wrong foot is not where you want to be with Mr. Beard. So going back to the third year in history with Dr. Singh. Uh, now, it says in the forum that uh, Dr. Singh, someone said that he, he was the most uninspiring teacher ever imaginable. Uh, I was actually his star pupil. I actually got on with really well with Dr. Singh once I understood what he was talking about. But what he would do, he would actually give you a list of questions. They were all O-level standard. Now, this is the third year. You know, we're only 14-year-olds and he's giving us O-level questions two years early. So you would just pick, pick a question. Uh, describe the rise of power of Adolf Hitler or compare him to Mussolini. So questions like that on all different uh, parts of history. Uh, and uh, we would answer them and he, he would just mark them in the night time and give you them back. And slowly, slowly, for instance, if one day you got a C minus uh, or a C, for instance, you try harder and harder and he actually brought you up to a standard uh, of Olam. So I'm in the back of the class and uh, Dr. Singh says, Andreas, I have recommended you for the O-level class. I was as happy as punch, as happy as punch that I was, in, uh, that I was going to uh, be promoted into an O-level class. We get into the fourth year and we're with history with Miss Bohr. Now, Miss Bohr is the nicest person you're ever likely to come across. Really, really, really pleasant uh, teacher she was. The only problem is, uh, compared to Dr. Singh's class, to Miss Bohr's class, it was designed on a CSC level, I realise that now. 
She had even written her own notes and everything. I mean, I know she did a lot of work, but it was all designed for CSC. On the very first day in the fourth year, the class was too easy. So always remember that, everybody. If the classes are too easy on the first day of the course, uh, then you are, what they say, one step towards decay. Uh, it was too easy. It was too easy. It was done. I mean, I was thinking, you know, Mr. Uh, Dr. Singh, uh, if he actually put me in an O-level class, because uh, the kind of people that were in the class, it didn't seem like an O-level class to me. Uh, it was set for CSE. Uh, a CSE class, and in the end, we wanted to do, I mean, we did the exam, and of course we failed the exam because we weren't geared up to the questions that we were doing in the third year. But Miss Ball was the nicest person. There was me, there was Scott Yates in the class, and we asked Miss Ball, can we do the O-level? Can we do the O-level? And she said, okay, I'll let you do the o -level. And there was no other teacher, no other teacher would, you know, you ask Mr. Beard, can you do the O-level if you, if you didn't pass the exam? He would say, did you pass the exam? Uh, no, sir. Well, why are you asking me that question? You know, I can understand that vindictiveness, uh, me being a teacher myself, you know, actually being vindictive and actually telling uh, students that they're not good enough. I can understand that mentality uh, of vindictiveness. But Miss Bohr was the nicest person. She actually let us do O-level history, which we failed with a university pass. A university pass because we weren't geared up for it. Weren't geared up for the exam at all. So back to Mr. Beard in physics. Uh, what Mr. Beard would do, he would write up an experiment on the board, and as you're writing it down, uh, then he would sort of conclude it. I said, I'm killing myself trying to write it down and put it in my book, and you've already concluded something that, you know, <laughs> you might say, uh, I, I, I would actually go and say, there's no such thing as bad student, only bad teacher. I'm sure Mr. Beard thinks it's probably the other way around. And maybe, maybe it's true. Maybe it's true. Uh, the kind of notes that Mr. Beard gave us, uh, they were too simplistic. Too simplistic for the O-level. Uh, you needed the Abbott. You need the complicated Abbott book, uh, which really had in-depth, you know, that is the kind of book uh, that you need to do. You learn your notes like a parrot it wasn't good enough for the exam. And I really felt sorry for the uh, smug Scott Yates when we did the mock. We did the mock and uh, Mr. Beard, what he would do is uh, he would photocopy uh, old papers, put them together. It was all smudged. It was all unclear. Uh, some, some questions were sideways. Some questions crossed over each other. You know, if you do a bad photocopy, I felt sorry for people like uh, Scott Yates suddenly he fails the exam. The only reason he failed the exam is he relied on Mr. Beard's note. I passed the exam because I had an Abbott and Mr. Beard even had a cheat when I went up to him uh, to find out if I was going to do the O-level. He says, yes, I put you in the O-level class, Andreas. I didn't think you were going to do that well. I said to him, look, sir, I knew I was going to do that well from the beginning. It's you that didn't know. Uh, but yes, uh, so Mr. Smug Scott Yates uh, who was actually, was I actually better than Scott Yates? Uh, no. It was funny actually once, someone actually said to the teacher, he said, uh, why are we doing, uh, why are we doing antimatter, sir? And Mr. Beard starts getting angry and said, there's no such thing as antimatter. I said, Mr. Beard, how's the Starship Enterprise run if there's no such thing as antimatter? You know, have you, have you ever watched an episode of Doctor Who? Uh, so obviously, uh, Mr. Beard, uh, <laughs> you know, to actually say, uh, I'm, uh, to be serious and everything, there is such a thing as antimatter, but I remember him getting really uh, snotty nose and saying, oh, there's no such thing as antimatter. Anyway, uh, I go round to uh, my cousin's house, my snotty nose grammar school cousin, and we're talking about O-level physics and everything, and I still believe that my snotty-nosed grammar school cousin actually believes that uh, people in grammar school, their, uh, our top student is probably as good as their worst student. Uh, I'd like to tell my snotty-nosed grammar school cousin that uh, there was a lot of people in our school that would have run rings round everybody in your grammar school. But it was funny, we were looking at an O-level question, 
and it was saying uh, one of the questions was uh, draw a pulley system with the re velocity ratio of five and I said to my cousin yeah because I was quoting Mr Beard yeah you count the number of strings so in other words you need one two three four five strings and my snotty nosed grammar school cousin turns around and said that's exactly what I would expect with you comprehensives to actually do that. It's not the number of strings, it's the number of pulleys. And I couldn't believe it. I said, Mr. Beard told me, can you imagine you're in the exam and you had to count the number of strings, which was a bit ambiguous. You know, drawing a pulley system with a velocity ratio of five is simply just drawing five pulleys. I couldn't believe it. And uh, my cousin was, uh, well, he, he was sort of vindicated as if to say, you know, only the best teachers uh, teach at grammar school. I think that my, gram uh, my snotty-nosed grammar school cousin was actually got a bit of a shock. There was one experiment that we did in chemistry uh, that if you didn't do properly, the actual, uh, the actual experiment would actually explode. And would you believe, this was in Marleybone Grammar School, my cousin was actually in the class where the teacher well, made a mistake and actually exploded. Uh, apparently, uh, the whole of Baker Street heard the explosion. But it was a very, very big explosion about 1975-76. Uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> and my cousin told me that the teacher actually started crying to everybody. He goes, my, my pupils don't trust me anymore. My pupils don't trust me anymore. And I, was, and I wanted to say to my cousin, I said, you got the best teachers. You know, your teacher nearly blew you all to smithereens. And away. Isn't it extraordinary, boys and girls? that this little button here, absolutely harmless now, So now we're up to the sixth form and I'm looking at my option sheet and I need one more subject. One more subject. Now I didn't want to go back to history. Uh, I even considered doing French. French instead of history, history being my worst subject. After all, I got a university pass. Uh, that's a U for anyone who doesn't understand what that is. That's ungraded, absolutely ungraded. We just weren't geared up for the exam at all. Anyway, I tried to uh, steer myself clear of history, uh, but the French teacher tells me, well, you haven't done French for two years. It's better if you go back to history. And I went, oh no. So I'm back with Miss Bohr in history. And I remember on the last lesson of the last year her saying, pass the exam everybody and you will not have to think about history for the rest of your life. And here we are back in Miss Ball's class for another year doing history. So talking about history, I've always had it in me and complained about how it was taught. History is just too big a subject. Now what it was, it was 1919, you know, the Treaty of Versailles to the present day. The present day up until June 1978. So all history included. Uh, so it was really funny, there was this uh, 20th century Duffy book. Uh, now I swear to you, the Duffy book was the size of the Crichton Report. And that had uh, 1919 to the present day. I remember my friend Mark Duff, he's in my class now. He actually uh, achieved a grade D. Now, if you achieve a grade D, that was actually a fail in those days. I mean, everything's a pass nowadays. But in those days, you get a grade D, that is a fail. Uh, but you're allowed to do the exam at Christmas. And I remember his favorite subject was the Vietnam War. The Vietnam War was in this uh, 20th century Duffy book, but there wasn't enough detail. It didn't matter if you had learned the whole book by heart, there just wasn't enough detail. And Mark Duff, well, we trusted the book. We trusted the book. And I remember him doing the exam in January. And I'm thinking, you know, he was company in the class. You know, the, uh, I mean, everybody else, uh, it was all girls in the class. And uh, uh, really, I was only with uh, Mark Duff as a friend of mine. Uh, so I'm thinking, well, he's probably passed the exam. I find out that he got another D. He got another D because he relied on the 20th century Duffy. 
I'll never forget that. I remember, I remember on the last day I forgot to hand the book in. Miss Bohr looked at me as if to say, well, it's the last day, Andres, you're supposed to hand the book in. I just forgot all about it. Then I received this letter in the summer holidays saying, you have one of these Crichton books called 20th Century Duffy in your possession. Can you please hand it in on your, uh, on your next convenience, as in passing the school? So I remember going all the way to the school to hand, I couldn't believe it. I even saved the letter, why they wanted the crappiest book in history. Uh, so anyway. <laughs> We're in, the, uh, we're in the class, and as I said, Miss Bohr is the nicest person you're ever likely to meet. Nicest person, really glad that, uh, that I had her for history. Um, what she would do is she would give everybody their favourite things, uh, like for instance, uh, Mark Duff, as I told you, his favourite subject was the, uh, uh, the Vietnam War. So they would say, well, write, uh, write everything you can on the Vietnam War and present it to the class. In other words, read it to the class. That's how it was done uh, in uh, Miss Bohr's class. So Mark Duff got the uh, Vietnam War and someone else got the Korean War, someone else got Hitler, Mussolini, everything, blah, blah, blah. Uh, Andreas, what are you going to do? Uh, well, I want to do the Korean War as well. No, you've got to do something new, says Miss Bohr. How about British politics? I said, Miss Bohr, I can't do British politics. I don't know anything about it. Go to the library. Go to the library. Easier said than done go to the library. Uh, the chances are, would you even find a book? And what, what can you talk about British politics from 1919 to the present day? So I kept on every week, I, there was a certain time when I had to present this to the class. And I kept on saying, I can't find, keep looking, Andreas, you'll do well, you'll do well. Anyway, it comes to the day with my British politics uh, project. And I've only got half a page. I couldn't find anything on it. Anyway, I read it to the class. It must have lasted two minutes. So I finished, and Miss Bohr turned around to the class and said, well, I have to tell you all that that will not be enough to pass you anything in the O-level. And I went, oh, for God's sake. I've been telling you for weeks that, uh, first of all, uh, British politics is uh, the most boring subject in the world. I couldn't find anything. But at least uh, uh, she was... Uh, <laughs> At least she was truthful, actually turning around to the class and saying, I'm afraid Andreas's report on British politics was not, it, probably in real life, you know, in, in probably real life, uh, there, there isn't much to British politics, you know, they, they're all brain empty in the House of Commons anyway. So it comes up to the O level, the O level retake, and I actually have. The, uh, well, these are not the ones I actually took. These are actual O-level papers. Don't let anybody in the newspaper say, oh yeah, well, uh, an exam was taken in the past. And these are actual exams. These are actual exams. This is June 1979, and this was a multiple choice paper. It was funny. Uh, now, I always blame uh, Mr. Rowland. It might not have been him, but I know there was a big rumpus. There was a question in the uh, multiple choice, and they come in and they tell everybody, we're sorry, we're sorry. Some of these questions, even us teachers are, are dumbfounded. And I said, what question is it? And have a look at the question, everybody. Okay, so this is a question, and everyone in, uh, and as I said, everyone in history, uh, they were really perplexed. What does this mean? You've got a stamp uh, with a mother, it looks like, holding and grabbing her child. So, it says here, uh, question 22 to 24 are based on the stamp issued to Hitler's Germany. Okay, it's something to do with the Tsar. Uh, the Tsar comes home. And the question is, the stamp commemorated the outcome of a, now, is it a blitzkrieg, a coup d'etat, a plebiscite, a purge, or a remilitarization? The thing is, you know, I mean, we're in the class, we're 16, 17 year olds, you know, teachers should actually be teaching you how to think. It's not likely to be a blitzkrieg, is it? That was the lightning strike by Hitler. It's not likely to be a coup de tatar, is it? Okay, a purge, maybe it could be that, you know, some kind of re remilitarization uh, to do with armaments and stuff. Doesn't really go with what's on the stamp. So even by elimination, even if you didn't know what plebiscite was, 
and that's uh, a vote, uh, a vote for people to actually vote for something. Uh, even if you didn't know what a plebiscite was, uh, you would go with plebiscite. So they do not teach you how to think. And apparently this event happened in January 1935. And I remember thinking how difficult a multiple choice uh, question uh, paper was. Never used to get anything right. And then I gave it to my dad, who uh, obviously lived through history, and he's saying, that's easy. That's, you know, there was a question, there was even a question on Eisenhower. There, is a, there was even a question on Eisenhower, and he said, yes, I know this one, I knew that one, I knew this one. And I said, it can't be that easy. And once my dad showed me how to think and everything, I was getting 100%. I was getting 100% in the multiple choices because there's always a whole load of rubbish that you've never heard before. I'll give you an example of uh, rubbish. Now, I'm sure there's people out there, historians will tell me, hey, wait a minute, Andy, uh, these things actually exist. Let me read it. It was set up in 1946 to improve the stability of international currencies and make available currencies that were needed for trade. Now, uh, everyone knows that's uh, IMF, the Intermonetary uh, uh, Fund, uh, but UN UNESCO, SHAPE, UNRWA, and the WHO. Well, the WHO is the World Health Organization. Probably all these other things exist, but as far as we were concerned, they didn't know. You're talking about monetary, that's an easy question. You go for the most obvious. And to just to tell you, I remember Mr. Holt. Mr. Holt once said, uh, and this is absolutely true. Uh, in uh, multiple choice, if you think it's uh, because you have five choices, A, B, C, D, and E, basically. Uh, if you think it's uh, either A or B, don't go for E. <laughs> We were laughing and laughing, but it's so true. You sort of think, yeah, I, th I think it's, uh, I think it might be between A and B. Oh, I'll, I'll just put E. That is just so true for Mr. Holt. Uh, but no, if you think logically, uh, that's something else. But the thing is, the teachers never taught you how to uh, how to think. Uh, so uh, yes, I probably teachers out there say, well, that's not our job to teach you how to think. Well, that's part of it, isn't it? I remember Miss Bohr always said. Uh, exam technique is almost everything. You know, you can at least uh, improve your grade by one level if you do that. Anyway, it comes up to the exam. Me and Mark Duff are sitting together. He's already done the O-level twice. He's got D on both occasions. Uh, I actually felt really sorry for him, but I was glad that he was in my class. I said, well, you can keep me company. Anyway, we sit, we're doing the history O-level, and let me tell you, uh, let me show you something, uh, it's a bit trivia, but I'll show you this from Grange Hill. The paper you're about to sit is Modern World History, O-Level. It's two hours long, you start at 9.15 and finish at 11.15. I shall warn you when you have half an hour left, and again, when you have five minutes left. In a few moments, I shall tell you that you may begin. Please read through the instructions on the front cover very carefully. And we can see that they are de definitely doing the same O level. Uh, it's Syllabus C, World of Prayers from 1919 to the present day. Now, there are uh, f uh, five sections. Section A is on Asia. Section B is on Africa and the Middle East. Section C is on the USSR and Eastern Europe. Section D is on the USA and the Americas. Uh, section E is on Western Europe, including Britain. Uh, that was the British politics that I uh, absolutely messed up earlier, just told you. And the last one is the general section, uh, which is general about everything. So we're on the last day. We're on the last day uh, of the class. And Miss Bohr comes and she's just marked my essay uh, and she says, Andreas, I have given you a D and that's the grade I think you're going to get in the exam. Now, if that had come from anybody else, because I know that Miss Bohr is the nicest person in the world, uh, she was just being factual. She wasn't being vindictive or anything like that. She was just being factual. That's the grade I think you will get. And I said to myself, if I get a D, that will be a real improvement from my university pass last time. Anyway, I tried my best and tried my best to try and uh, just pass. She also advises us a bit of exam technique, Miss Bohr. She says, please don't go to question F. Uh, if you go to section F, you failed the exam. 
you know, you should be able to do everything from the other sections. Uh, section F, where they were a bit ambiguous, the questions. It was questions like, um, what can you say about the uh, American Apollo missions only bringing a few rocks to Earth? Uh, you know, it was, it was something like that where you couldn't really get the maximum amount of points. They were desperation. If you were really desperate, you would go to the general section. Anyway, the exam, the O-level comes, I go straight to section F. Uh, <laughs> I actually disregarded what Miss Bohr had said. The reason I did that is because I'd seen an O-level before and every, uh, every O-level, what would happen is in section, in uh, the general section, it would have uh, either the League of Nations, something on the League of Nations, and then the next year it would have the United Nations. So the year before they had the League of Nations and I said, ah, I took a chance here. That morning of the exam, I just studied, uh, I just studied the United Nations. And guess what? It comes up in the exam. Obviously, I have to go to that section straight away because if I don't, I'm going to forget what I've learned in the morning. And I wrote everything on the United Nations. That was one in the bag. Uh, and in the end, I couldn't believe it. Mark Duff, a few months later, he comes up to me and he says, did you pass, Andreas? Did you pass? I said, yeah. What grade did you get? He got a C. So Mark Duff, congratulations to him. He finally passed the exam. And then he almost is flabbergasted when I say to him, yeah, but I got a B. <laughs> he was almost on the floor. He couldn't believe it. He had his mouth open like this. Uh, and I said to him, uh, yeah, I can't believe it either. But uh, from my worst subject, I'd like to thank Miss Ball. From my worst subject, uh, history suddenly became my favourite subject. But why? Because I know a lot of stuff. Uh, I don't think that's the case. Good job I did what I did, otherwise I could have ended up like this poor guy in Grange Hill. Ooh. What's the matter, Christopher? Sit up at once, boy. I can't. What? I can't do it. What? I can't do the page! Oh. I've done it! Oh. I've Outside, just, Mr. I've Come just on, please. Please. Come on, out. Thank you. Please, please, please. Okay. But, but I can't do it. Quiet. Yeah, but I've become a school for five and I can't do it. So I think it's a prerogative for a teacher to be vindictive. Uh, that is what a teacher is. He has to be vindictive. Uh, Miss Ball was uh, not like that. She was a she was lovely, lovely woman. Uh, Mr. Beard, a uh, man after my own heart. Uh, I'm a teacher as well. I find it difficult to be vindictive when someone says to me that uh, they should be in a certain level. They've tried hard and you're just going to enjoy it when you say, no, you're not. You know, you're doing CSC. Uh, now, I must have said this once to somebody. I said, I think Mr. Beard has it in for us. And so I go up to Mr. Beard and he says, we don't have it in for you, Andreas. I said, who told you that? He goes, the reason that we have it in for you <laughs> is that your exam results are poor. You know, as soon, it only takes is one second, one second for your exam results to go a little bit low and Mr. Beard is on top of you like a uh, ton of bricks. Instead of sort of giving you encouragement and everything, he said, come on, what's the matter, Andres? Is, is there anything wrong? You know, start uh, pulling your socks up. You know, we're near the end of the course, you know, let's really go f forward. And uh, yeah, well, uh, poor Mr. Beard, I've got proof that he's a bit vindictive. I remember Venturino was uh, promoted to his O-level class. And I remember poor Venturino was standing next to the, uh, uh, you know, the science labs that you have in the South Wing. And uh, he went up to him and said, who said you could be in here? You know, I've been promoted, sir. Who promoted you? Why are you here? What are you doing here? Now, Venturino had a bit of a reputation that he messed about and everything. He wasn't a bad lad. Venturino Constantinos was uh, actually a really great lad. He, he was always funny. Always funny, made me messed about a bit, but he's a, he's a fifth former now, you know, he's, he's not going to be trouble. Uh, but in the end, Venturino actually stayed in the class. Uh, he was really good at physics. I remember uh, Mr. Beard made him do CSE. Nice little vindictiveness there. He got a grade one. Now, I remember someone saying to me that uh, when you have a grade, uh, like uh, in CSE, the teacher gives you a grade and it's the grade you get in the O-level. For instance, if you get a grade one in the O-level and, you, and your teacher gives you a three, that means you get a grade two. 
kind of been the case in physics because I remember Venturino coming up to me and saying, what grade did you get in O-level, Andres? And I said, a C. I got a grade one CSC and I didn't even work nearly as hard. And I sort of looked at him and I said, yeah, well, you got a grade one CSC, but I'm afraid the certificate isn't worth using as toilet paper. I've said that before. So yes, we worked hard, but at least our certificate is actually worth something. And another thing about vindictiveness, we had a guy called Shazy. Uh, Shazy turned up in about the fourth or fifth year. I mean, he was like David Singleton, really, really clever, really, really clever. I used to say to him, there's Shazy. Now, if you're Greek, <laughs> you would know that there's something wrong. Uh, it's, a, it's a bad word, it's a bad Greek word. And Mr. Beer came up to me and said, what does it mean, Andreas? What does it mean? Um, uh, I, 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 I plead the Fifth Amendment, I said to him. I said, I can't really tell you what it means. I'll find out. I'll find out. Obviously, Mr. Beard knew a lot of Greek people. But anyway, taking that aside, Shazy was really, really clever. And even Mr. Beard, as soon as his marks went down, they were on top of him. We don't think you're going to pass. They tried to chuck him out of the school. His parents came to save the day and he even had the cheek in class. Uh, obviously he passed the exam and he turned around to Shazy and said, we have to admit uh, that we didn't think Shazy was going to pass. How can you think that Shazy was not going to pass? You know, a David Singleton kind of character, a genius, you know, <laughs> you know, an Einstein, and you were quick. Just because he got one uh, poor mark uh, in, in his, uh, uh, as he was going through his A-level, you know, you were quick, you know, to throw the book at him and stamp on him. And I've got a really funny story, at least I think it's a funny story. Uh, I know a lot of people out there will not find this funny at all. Uh, but uh, it's about Gareth Alcock, and uh, he wanted to do uh, A-level, A-level physics. Uh, Mr. Beard actually encouraged him to do it. But before that, uh, Gareth asked him, uh, Mr. Beard, I have to ask you, is physics A-level something for Shazy? Do you have to be a real genius to actually uh, be able to do this, uh, do this course? And Mr. Beard said to him, uh, well, I, I don't, maybe you won't get an A, but I think you'll do really well at it. Mr. Gareth Alcock failed his A-level, and I remember Mr. Beard, he was really upset about it. He goes, oh, that Gareth Alcock, he should have passed. Only because he encouraged him to do it. Uh, so uh, there you go. But uh, I can understand vindictiveness. Uh, the only thing I can say is that um, thank goodness I didn't become a pilot and thank goodness that uh, Mr. Beard wasn't my uh, pilot supervisor because I can just imagine something going wrong in the cockpit and uh, Mr. Beard saying, fix it, fix it, fix it now. And I'm saying, Mr. Beard, look, calm down, calm down, we'll work this out. Fix it, fix it now, Andres, fix it, you know. It's like uh, swimming the channel, uh, swimming the channel, and Mr. Beard's on a boat, and as soon as you start getting a little bit tired, or you're, you know, you, you, you know, you're coming up to the end where you're slowing down, and you're going a little bit under the water, it's like Mr. Beard getting his foot and actually pushing you under. No encouragement at all, pushing you under. But I can understand it, uh, the uh, vindictiveness of being a teacher. Uh, but apparently Mr. Beard and uh, Miss Borg got together. I mean, that, to me, that's uh, chalk and cheese. I hope they're really happy together and everything. But, uh, you know, you've got such a nice teacher, uh, such a nice teacher, Miss Borg, and uh, a little bit of a, a vindictive guy like Mr. Beard. But I can understand it being a teacher myself. So that's it. That's uh, history and physics in a comprehensive school as I personally experienced it. I hope you enjoyed it and uh, I will leave it off with me trying to achieve my pilot's license in a Boeing 747 with Mr. Beard as my supervisor. Well, Mr. Beard, cruising at 10,000 feet, no sign of turbulence, everything on auto cruise control, all hanky-dory at the moment, sir. Well done, Andreas. I can see that you will be a fully qualified commercial pilot in no time. Thank you, Mr. Beard. What's happening? Exit address. Okay, Mr. Beard, I'm working on it. Andreas, I 
said fix it. I said I'm working on it, Mr. Beard. Just relax, will you? Andreas, I said now. Mr. Beard, just sit back. I've got this, I promise you. situation immediately, Andreas. Stop being a backseat driver, Mr. Beard. Solve this problem now, Andreas. I'm doing my best, Mr. Beard. Just give me a chance and get out of my face. Do something now, Andreas. I'm trying to work out what this is, Mr. Beard. Relax, will you? at least Andreas. You're not helping Mr. Beard. Stop pulling the choke Andreas. That's not the choke Mr. Beard. I do know what I'm doing you know. You're failing your commercial pilot's license Andreas. I do realize that Mr. Beard. Mr. Beard, please! Mr. Beard!